I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Since the 1950s, the Newport Jazz Festival has offered a reliable read on the spinal center of jazz. That's what the New York Times reported in this year's write-up of the annual event in Rhode Island. The review notes that the spinal center is evolving into a more youthful sound, beautifully exemplifying the new era is soulful trumpeter Theo Croker. An adventurous musician hailing originally from Florida, Leesburg, Croker returned recently to the United States after a seven-year residency at Shanghai's House of Blues. Theo Croker is one of the most creative trumpeters on the horizon today and is also one of the most energetic artists I've ever encountered. Those are the words of legendary jazz man Marcus Belgrave. His latest album, Escape Velocity, is an energetic immersion into, as spoken in the opening track's verse, our divine earthly experience to fulfill, raising our vibrations, reclaiming the peace. The time has come to transcend, and I'll ask Theo to transcend what? and when and how. <laughs> it was really magical to see you with the trumpet in Newport. Congratulations on that performance. Thank you, Alex. You were saying to me that was something else. It was great. That, that whole festival has an amazing energy. It was your first time? That was my first time ever going, ever playing. It was, it was quite a, a rush. And I think there was an artist who called in sick and you did double or triple duty. Yeah, we did double duty and we knew about it a couple of hours before we left to go. So, I mean, I was asked and of course I was like, yeah, yeah I'll play twice. <laughs> at the director of the program, I think he recounted, texted you in the middle of the night. Yeah, Danny Melnick, great guy. And, and um, he texted me and I was like, I don't really understand because it's like four in the morning, but yes, I'm down. And he was like, well, I was like, look, I'm down for whatever. Just yes. <laughs> How did you train to have the mental oh. and physical patience for that? I guess I'm still training and yeah, constantly training. Um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, you just have to stay focused on each step at a time and not, not get too carried away with the end result, um, especially in an art form like music where there really is no end result. So it's kind of coming to peace with that and just that every day is a, is a, is a lesson, is a challenge. And in those words of the opening track, what are you transcending? <laughs> well, mainly that whole opening track is just a it's a it's a call. It's a call to it's a call to action for everybody to kind of look inside of themselves and find their best self and bring that forward so that we can all vibrate together and have a, you know, a more loving, a more peaceful environment to exist in. You produced that in 2016. Yes, with the help of uh, uh, the drummer, Casa Overall. But it was quite precocious and prescient, was it not, in the climate we live in today of disunity, incivility? Yeah, it, it was. And, discord um, as opposed to peace. Absolutely. And I mean, as an artist, I mean, I, I don't, it may not be true for all art forms, but as an artist, I feel if we're not dealing with what the society is dealing with in our art, then we're kind of missing a lot of our purpose. We should either be distracting people so they can just kind of deal with it and be happy, or we should be helping them deal with it and be happy, like the situation that they're in. So find, trying to find a way to inspire people to move forward and come together. Instrumentally, <laughs> you do that with gusto. I, I try. Without the words, what is the power of instrumental music, which you seldom hear on the radio today, or XM, Pandora? I really wonder if you were to email the Pandora headquarters and ask how many folks are listening to musical, yeah. instrumental. I'm sure there, there are stars like you and, of course, the Native American flute ensemble or some variety. Oh, that's cool. That's <laughs> Kenny G. Yeah. But... Uh, you br seemingly bring back a vibrant tenacity that is primarily instrumental, and you retain a younger audience. How do you do that? I, I don't know. That's <laughs> no, that's not, that's not good enough. I mean, enough. 
you know, I mean, all, all sound is, vibrations create sounds, all vibrations, and everything vibrates. Everything from the cup to, to our bodies, to our brain waves, every, everything's a vibration. So, you know, all the notes corresponds with, correspond with different chakras, different energies, different moods, all the keys relate to different moods, different feelings. And we're simply just taking that code that, that nature gave us with music and putting it together in different ways. So it, I strongly believe that if the intent of the musician is to, to be of, of a great impact to the listener, then that's, you know, all the musical statements that they make are valid and real and true. Define great impact. Well, just, just to have you, you know, be able to step out of your, it, like when I go to hear a great musician play, I want to be removed from my life. As, as I'm dealing with it. I want to be removed from the hustle and bustle of the city, riding the subway, dealing with people that, you know, like some of the negative energy you have to deal with or maybe whatever kind of difficulty you're facing in life, you know, personally or financially or at work, anything like that. I, I want that to all be removed for the time that I'm listening to kind of go into like an alternate universe of just we, we're here vibrating and we feel good and the blood starts to starts to raise and get get warm and your body starts to vibrate, you know, and, you, and your soul opens up basically to the music. So to, to me, that's what I'm looking for with music. Well, if you can open soulfulness in what seems to be a society infected with soullessness, you're a saint. You're a modern day <laughs> saint. I'm, I'm like, I, I possess what everybody, what everybody has and vice versa. I think everybody's capable of doing it. I don't think you have to be a, a musical master. I, again, it's, it's the intent. You studied here in the U.S. in Oberlin. Yes. And then you took a sabbatical, if you will, overseas, right, in Asia? I, I would call it an adventure. Adventure. <laughs> tell, tell our viewers about that. Um, when I graduated college, I, I had trouble finding work in New York, and something popped up and an opportunity in China, Shanghai, China, um, where the club would fly out the whole band and house you for uh, three to six months and you would play six nights a week, uh, three shows a night. So to me, that's like, that sounded like the 50s, you know, like 52nd Street and, and the clubs in Harlem, Mintons and stuff where it used to just be, they would hire bands to play for a long period of time, multiple, multiple months at a time. And that's the way a lot of the old, older mentors like Marcus Belgrave and Tootie Heath and Gary Bartz, that's the way they always told us how they learned how to really play this music. So those opportunities don't exist in the States that I'm aware of. So when it came up, uh, I, I jumped at it. I put together a band of who was willing to go because we knew very little about China at that time. It was 2007, so only know, we knew very little. And um, we went over there, man, and they loved the music. We just played, and we ended up staying. I mean, I made a few trips back and forth the first few years, but eventually I ended up staying there for seven years. So is jazz really universal? Jazz really is universal, and, the, and what's classified under jazz, other, other places outside of America is, would surprise most Americans. Like Stevie Wonder is a jazz musician in China. He's not a pop musician or r and He's not, it's not separated. They pretty much consider most black music that's not hip hop and a lot of hip hop jazz. So it's really a little more encompassing than, than we see it here. It's not so separated in other places. Probably for the better. Yeah, I mean, I've, uh, you know, uh, we, we have our way of doing things here. I don't know if it's for the better or worse. It just, it is what it is, and it supports whatever model the industry has, I guess. But over there, there is no industry. So when somebody comes to hear you play, they just want to hear you play. What do you mean there is no industry? There's no recording industry mm -hmm. or radio industry, other than, you know, government run, which is, which is actually very, um, very eclectic, the programming. And, uh, yeah, it's very... And, um, but there's no, you know, you don't release an album and drop an album and compete on charts or at least in the, in the non-pop world. It's just, so the, it's really performance-based. People come to a show, 
all the time. Some you could see the same people three or four nights in a row at the at the club, or or you know if you're there for three months, they'll you'll see that same person twenty times. So they're they're really about experiencing that live interaction of the improviser and of the music, the sorry the musician together. So that's really the whole. That's the nucleus of it all. It's not a record sale or a music video or at least in this in this genre in the performance space. So it's very it's very interactive. It's and how cool. are you acclimating back to America now? It's cool. It's coming. Been, it's coming to America. Wild. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I've been back since 2013, the end of 2013, and um, it was cool. I had to start over, you know. I had to learn to eat a different kind of way again because it's a whole different system of eating food. And, you know, now when I'm in the street and people are speaking Chinese, I, I understand it. So it's, I don't have that piece anymore, <laughs> you know. And um, it's just different. And a lot of stuff changed while I was gone. Um, just even from when I've been back to now, a lot of things have changed. Did anything change about jazz? Yes, it, it, it's, it's changed. I guess the perception of jazz has changed. The j jazz itself doesn't change. It, um, different things get highlighted at different points in time. It, we're all pulling. But that's interesting. That from 2009, yeah, even seven, earlier, 2007, yeah, until 13, something yeah. Changed about the perception of jazz. What what changed? I think it became jazz began to reach a younger audience again, you know, and not a younger audience that is in the suit and ties and pretending it's the 40s, you know, like, <laughs> you know, that, and me, that's me and, loosen this right. No, I mean, that's a great that's a great era of music and everything. But those musicians like Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, Roy Eldridge, they were all cutting edge you know, practically pop stars. Well, Louis Armstrong definitely was a pop star. So, you know, they were never playing an old, an old way. They were never going backwards. They were always looking forward, trying to move forward. And I think that reemerged in, in, the, in the, I guess you would call it the mid-thousands or late 2000s. Um, I think a lot of jazz musicians began to come, come into, come into fru fruition with with that have been influenced by hip hop and and R and B and other you know electronic music, other forms of music. So we started to bring that music in to jazz and and you know mix it together. You had Robert Glasper's Black Radio, that turned a lot of people on to jazz, um, and he was doing it using people like Lupe Fiasco, Erica Badu, Jill Scott. So he was kind of mixing mixing the the followings together. So people started to realize, wow, I, I like jazz, you know, even though you heard it on Tribe Called Quest. But it's still, I think people became a little more aware that, oh, this music's actually pretty vibrant. It's not just like my grandparents' style or my dad's style. It's actually relevant to what's happening now and where music itself is right now. I'm so glad that you explained that. I tried. <laughs> I, because I honestly, it gives me pleasure and hope as an admirer of yours and of this genre that it's not just for folks at the beacon no. here in new york or w whatever the counterparts are in your cities yeah. across the country it is the offerings at newport this year mm -hmm. 2017 suggest an epiphany a renaissance yeah. A new generation. What did you learn from your fellow artists during the Newport experience? Oh, man. Well, it's just I think it's great how inclusive a festival like that can be while still holding its roots to jazz. So you can go see. I saw Cyrus Chestnut's trio, who's a great pianist, but it's jazz, straight ahead jazz play. And then we went across the stage and we saw the Philadelphia experiment with Christian McBride and Questlove and DJ Logic and the Roots were playing. Sean Jones was playing, a great trumpet player. So it it was so much of like it was so much of what they call the some of the children of jazz. Some the the funk and the grooves and everything was still being incorporated, which I think is beautiful. And I, I guess I don't think it's new to do that. 
jazz always did that. We had grooves in the 70s and 60s, like it's not. But the fact that we're not separating it anymore, we're, we're swinging and we're grooving. Uh, we're, 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 we're not saying, okay, this is the only thing that's jazz. The jazz box is now full. To what do you attribute when you describe that transformation from 2007 to 2013? Oh man. Well, I, I really think I really think it was players, like, well, I, I can drop names. This is cool. Like Marcus Strickland, and and Robert Glasper and Esperanza Spalding, uh, Christian Scott. I, I think it's all of those artists coming to coming of age, and and uh, a lot of them are my peers. And the fact that we all grew up listening to all sorts of music. We all grew up listening to, of course, everything from the old school to funk and R&B and soul music in the 90s, 90s R&B, which was beautiful, uh, which is gone now, which is strange. And, um, you know, early hip hop, like real hip hop with a, with a message. And so the fact that we also studied the tradition of jazz and that any tradition can only move forward when you when you know it and then when you incorporate other traditions within it. So it was the whole mixing of what we we're influenced by, like why, because there was this whole movement in the 90s to exclude everything from jazz and just focus on a certain period or certain periods of jazz, which is not ever what the spirit of the music has been about. What about the politics of the, of the music? We touched a little bit of that just now. <laughs> it's, you mean like business or... Well, not the business so much as whether or not the groove, as you yeah. describe it, can have a potent effect on the human psyche. Well, it, we know it does. <laughs> but It doesn't seem to be driven to the right groove right at the present moment in terms of the civility of our culture. But jazz while it can be funky and groovy, right. is pretty civilized. And you go to Newport or Saratoga. Yeah. I don't know about not Montreal, <laughs> but Newport, Rhode Island, Saratoga, New York, and I'm sure there's Monterey, right? Yeah, that's a great place. California. Yeah. It is groovy, funky, and civilized. It, it, it is. It, it can be. I mean, jazz is a, it is a thinking music but all music is thinking music. Um, it's just how much are you gonna allow yourself to think? All music is thinking music? It's all there to make you think something. It might not be, <laughs> it might not be a very high level thought. Right. It could be a very low level thought you're dealing with. You know, we could be, we could be dealing with in the club type of behavior, but that's, that is a form of thinking and it is a form of social behavior. So I think jazz doesn't exclude that. It just, you know, presents it in a much more mature way. What do you think the influence has been of the roots and the immersion of jazz on late night, both yeah. NBC and CBS? Is that perhaps, does that also deserve credit for a regeneration of jazz? Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think having those bands, like I, I assume you mean like John Baptiste. Baptiste um, and, and the, the roots, roots, of course. Um, and it's nice to hear the Roots playing. You know, they play stuff like Actual Proof by Herbie Hancock. You know, they're, they're like really bringing a lot more of the, of, the, of the jazz repertoire, exposing it to, to an audience, which I think is beautiful. And I think it, it does show a reemergence of interest in jazz. But you, you have to remember that it's all, jazz has always been relevant and it's always existed. It didn't go away. We, you know, the musicians were just we just weren't being seen or being heard, but that never stops it. You can always go to any city in America, practically anywhere in the world, and find enthusiasts and, and people that are studying this art form and not you said, never letting it go. You said Louis yeah, or Louis. Louis Armstrong. Yeah. Now you are a you are a trumpeter extraordinaire. <laughs> I'm 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 a trumpeter. I asked you before <laughs> and you sidelined the question when I said the physical capacity uh, and the training from a young age. I think you were five or six when you started playing the trumpet. Uh, Eleven, yeah. Eleven? Yeah. I would think earlier to have that facility. 
Uh, when did you first experience the trumpet? Oh, well, you know, my, my grandfather was Doc Cheatham, a legendary trumpet player. So I, I remember seeing him play as early as six years old. And um, I always loved music. It was always, you know, I, as a child, I was quite active, we could say. So I, you could never get me to settle down to focus on one thing. Um, but I knew I loved music. And when one day, you know, the, the, the middle school band came to the elementary school and let us play all the instruments, and I, I signed up for the trumpet right away. And that was kind of it. <laughs> so once I got one, um, that was just, you just couldn't get me to stop playing it. I related in your biography to that grandfatherly inspiration. Yeah, totally. Um, was it the DNA? You know. What, what led you to gravitate towards the trumpet as opposed to another in instrument? Uh, you know, my, my spiritual beliefs would say yes. But um, scientifically, I don't know if the DNA decided that for me or not. Um, I do know that I would be here without it, for sure. If I didn't have the grandfather and I didn't, I didn't have it in my blood, I would still have picked it up and played it and did the work to get where I am now, for sure, on the instrument and the music. Now, for the folks watching this presentation, where can they see you perform in the future, Theo? Oh, cool. Well, um, I guess the next time I'm playing in New York City is with, with my group from Escape Velocity, and it's on September 25th at the Blue Note. Beyond that, Beyond how can that? they act? How do, you, how do you, as the musician, we had Otmar Liebert here, and he... Oh, cool. He's, he was reminding... The listeners that Pandora is not the ideal way to yeah. experience it for. Oh, I mean, okay, a plug the musician. A, a, I mean, the best way plug to away. the best way to support a musician is to buy the physical product, which is now I think is pretty much Barnes and Nobles and Amazon, and um, you can stream the music. That's great, but when you purchase the music, you're 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 putting a notch on the board for that artist. Um, Where do you want to bring? the impact of instrumental music where it's not being felt right now? Oh, that's a good question. I, I really think, I think at the state that we're in in this country artistically, um, through our current administration, that children are probably going to suffer the most. In, in 10 years, you know, young children now, are, I don't know if they're going to be hip to what's going on with instrumental music and the magic that it that it brings into their life. So I, I think if if it was my mission to expose or reach more people, I would definitely go after the young young children. Wow. <laughs> the children, you don't want them to be desensitized. Man, no, I mean music saved my life, honestly. I was I was a very hyperactive child and my parents would not medicate me. Um, and uh, I, I didn't have any kind of focus, and I had behavior issues because I didn't have focus, and I had nowhere to put all that energy. And when I got into band class, the band director at that time, his name was Doug Yop. He was the man who actually taught everybody. In, he taught everybody in the class together, like 60 students, how to play the instrument from scratch together. We all learned in a group. Um, that really, you know, the the inspiration and the support and the, the energy that he put into it really gave me a place to put all of my energy and all of my wildness and all my creativity. And then as, as time progressed, that became an outlet for me to express myself without having to you know, be crazy, I guess. So it's, I think, you know, it teaches you, music teaches you how to work with others, absolutely. It teaches you how to be creative. It activates the creative side of your brain, which you need if you're gonna be a physicist, a pilot, an engineer, all these, all these great professions. Or, or I'm sure a lawyer needs it, a doctor. You need creativity to solve every problem. You have to be creative. You can't just apply a formula, especially to a new problem or problems in the future. So, and I, it teaches, it teaches, you know, Wynton Marsalis likes to say, 
<laughs> that it that it it's a it's a very um, clear form of democracy to play music with people because you have to we have to negotiate. It's like having a conversation. We can't over talk each other. We can't exclude anybody. We have to do it together, or it's just one person, which is not a great effect. So. I think it's, it's important and it gives children something to do, especially in some of these harder hit communities, economically and socially. Children, they need an, an outlet. It can't just be sports, you know, because sports is very, it's very good. We need that too. We need physical activity, but sports is very, you know, it's a very commercial commercial, you know, moving into that. When you're in your marching band, it's not a lot of commercialism around the marching band or a concert band or a jazz band in school. You're just, you're there to play the music. So I, I think it's important. Well, one other place I would propose, Silicon Valley Twitter <laughs> headquarters. Yeah. I think you should pay a visit. Okay. We have a lot of folks come on the show talk about the effect of social and new media. Absolutely. On society. And when you say you're concerned about the children yes. and that that's the audience of jazz listenership that you aspire to fulfill your goal as a, as a pro-social yes. musician. Go see Theo on iTunes or in concert. Magical trumpeter. Thank you. Pleasure being with you today. Nice being with you too. Thank you for having me. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.